coming up this week on Rock and Roll Grad School. Woomp, there it is. We talk to DC Glenn, the brain supreme from Tag Team. That's this Wednesday, Rock and Roll Grad School, available wherever you get your podcasts, rockandrollgradschool.com. Why is recorded in front of a live studio audience? I don't know what made me think of this, but um, so I got a text message from a friend of mine the other day. Who, is this a good thing or is this just a weird story? No, it's a good story. Okay, it just sounds so, like and do you know? I and it was also show. after I know <laughs> it was also after I watched um, Battle of the Network Stars, which recently. Yeah, I texted you the other night and told you this. Why did I, okay. I watched Battle of the Network Stars, the episode, and just perchance, the right. episode was Linda Carter, mm-hmm. Adrian Barbo, and a host sure. of others. And it was, mm-hmm. first of all, there's so many things that are questionable, but yep. also it was fantastic, and I loved every I, minute of it. And Christy yeah. McNichol was either on that episode or the episode I watched after. Okay. Which led me to this that my friend texted me and shared with me that did you know that she had a single called wait, I got it wrong. Hold on. Pumping and blowing. Um no. Yeah, I suggest we check it out. Oh, YouTube. Yeah. It's it's a doozy. I somehow feel there weren't the same rules for Christie as there were for Marie Osmond. Yeah. Oh, it's from the pirate movie. It's... There you go. But, I mean, I'm sure it's all about... Not now, Randy. Pirate <laughs> things, and it's, yeah, but right. it's... It I'm just, just playing it now. Translates. It's an old wives' tale. Right? Yeah, this is good. Isn't it good? I mean... So does she say pumpkin and blowing? I just hear the... I, I hear the oh, men no, growling pumping and then her... And then the women and blowing. This is one I don't think I ever saw the film. Yeah, I don't think I actually saw it either. I remember it, but I don't... Maybe I saw it and I'm like in Nokia or something. But this was also the same era of of you shook me all night long so i mean obviously that's the comparison well i mean we're talking um like i was thinking maybe bring out like i don't know like i mean physical i thought maybe i was gonna say physical physical. (laughs) and this is if if you uh assume um melanie's brand new key as sort of your baseline yes of course and then you go up a few, assuming as times change, we all become a little bit more uh, grown up. Yes. So we as a society are ready for Christy McNichols pumping and blowing. <sighs> yes. But yeah. Still. And there's a karaoke backing track, should we ever wish to whip <laughs> it out at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this goes on the pre-show set music from when we tour this show live. Yes, that's exactly why I brought it up. This is Why, with your hosts, Heidi Hedquist and Luke Poling. So I guess my first question is, what is so punk rock about vegan food? <laughs> you know, that's, a, that's actually a good question. No one ever asks it that way. <laughs> and, uh, and it's insightful. Um, that's, yeah, they're attracted to it a bit. And I'd say that it's kind of two-pronged. 
And one of one of them is that people derided vegan cuisine and, and stuff like that were very dismissive of it and it wasn't mainstream at all around the time when punk rock started and, and as it developed, you know. So I think they were attracted to it partly because it was also alternative. So you've got a alternative look, you've got an alternative politics, you've got an alternative lifestyle, and you have an alternative way of eating. So I think there was a little bit of a FU kind of <laughs> mentality to it. And as like, I think like as the politics of punk developed, you know, especially uh, when people started doing like communes and, and bands like Kraft and stuff got more popular, that you started to see a, a more political shift and people started doing it for political reasons. And, and they feed into each other a bit. There's even like specifically vegan punk rock topically. <laughs> a little narrow, if you ask me, but uh, so that that's the answer. It's like, it was a little bit of a, I think like a, a sideways F off to people at first and then kind of morphed into something that was viewed as more humanitarian. Now, did you start off as a musician or as a chef? I, I started playing music and um, more like putting shows on and letting bands stay at my house before I actually started performing in a band. I did uh, write songs for other people, but not super often. And uh, yeah, so uh, music came first and food later. Basically, as what? the utility bands would come and stay with me and they would complain that they were hungry. So I started trying to make the food and it was usually terrible. So I was like, okay, I got to figure this out. So that's how that started. <laughs> so what made you decide to spin that off so that you were then sharing your chef creations and your life as a chef with the world, not just with the random rockers crashing on your couch? Um, what? I, I, you know, I, I got better at it. And then at some point, like a, a, fr a friend of mine was like, your food's pretty good. Why, you know, you should do something with it. So I started doing a secret cafe and the motivation was to get better and to also make a little bit of money. And uh, that was late nineties and I lived in Seattle. So it had a couple of, you know, I wanted to learn more about food because I, I was enjoying it. I started to feel like I had the knack for it. And friends of mine were liking what I was making at my, at my little dinners or for shows or whatever. So I was like, okay, I'll, let's try to half acidly monetize this and see what happens. And it went okay. It was a little hit or miss, you know, people that attended would definitely <laughs> have stories about that. But uh, yeah, and then it went from there and I started collecting recipes and then a friend challenged me to write them down. And I, I finished the book that I worked on with him and, and, I only had punk rock as a model for selling it. So I was like, I'm going on tour to sell this cookbook. <laughs> so that was the train of events that led to, to sharing it. And um, I mean, sorry to go on and on, but once, uh, once that developed and I got my little network together of people that wanted to host dinners and stuff, I just kept doing it because it went well and it was fun. And I got to travel and the travel would more or less be paid for by, even though I didn't really charge a lot and took like the Greyhound everywhere. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it would basically be paid for as I went along. I kind of first became aware of your work through two of your cookbooks. There is Comfort Eating with Nick Cave and Defensive Eat Eating with Morrissey. Who's the harder artist to pair with food? Of those two? Of the two. I, I mean, to an extent, it was Morrissey, but it, the reason for that was that book I felt like was much more parodying and a little less reverent than the Nick Cave one, and also the Nick Cave one is entitled Comfort Food, mm -hmm. and Autumn, the artist, had selected uh, these themes, by the way, so the challenge really was to kind of make whatever she showed them enjoying in the, <laughs> the picture she drew. So, uh, yeah, I'd say Morrissey was more challenging because some of the stuff was outlandish or, or, or not, it doesn't exist, you know. And that, that's always a little, like, I mean, I've done things with recipes that supposedly came from space and or back, you know, like another dimension. So I, I can do it, but it's a lot, a lot more challenging when there's absolutely no basis for, for what you're trying to do. N not to uh, pigeonhole Morrissey, but I feel like, you know, 
the best food is celebratory and is uh, is enjoyed together and there's a, a you know this kind of communal aspect to it Morrissey doesn't strike me as a guy that you want to hang out with whereas Nick Cave seems like somebody we are like we we could we could get, go down some dark streets together trading stories and talking and yeah I, I mean I don't really know personality wise <laughs> I mean we uh, you know Nick Cave does seem more approachable Mm-hmm. And uh, I think he had, at least as far as you know, the better sense of humor about it. Although um, some of the people around Morrissey thought it was funny, uh, I, I don't know what he thought of it to be honest. And, uh, that's fine. <laughs> so no idea if Moz has been cooking from that book. Yeah, that's a good question. Maybe he tried a recipe out. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, because they're both. Uh, you know, I think Nick Cave more recently, but both at, at least vegetarian uh, for the most part, at least, and mostly vegan. You know, Morrissey supposedly indulges in, what was it, Yorkshire puddings or something, but he might have just said that to set people off, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's face it, you know, yeah, anyway. To that point, most of the vegans I know have that one food that is completely non-vegan, completely naughty and off the rails. Do you find that as well? And if so, what's yours? Yeah, and, and mine's salami, but I've created this <laughs> um, way of making something that satisfies most of the, the points that I like about it. And that actually, like the past like couple of weeks, I've been making them like the Dickens. <laughs> Whenever I get stressed out, I'm like, oh, that steak looks pretty good. So it's, it, which is it's, it's a little interesting I, like I don't you know if I get the urge to eat meat or something like that it's usually it, like because I feel like traumatized <laughs> 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 you know I feel traumatized cows traumatized well, traumatized so I'm like okay but you know I know enough about cooking and my own personality and problems that I can go oh oh <laughs> so, I've got to, I've got so now I've been making these uh these little salami <laughs> that out of my homemade meat just to like stave it off so I don't pass by somebody's belly tray and just pick one off and start it down. So <laughs> I'm trying to behave over here. But yeah, that's definitely the one. And I don't exactly know why, but it's something about the spiciness and the texture. Yeah. And then it's all it's like a slice. <laughs> it's like, ooh, a little slice. You know? right. Well and I feel like if you are gonna go off the rails like you have to really go like it has to be something like salami like some sort of cured processed spicy like you said (laughs) Uh, a rare steak would be second place and and that just you know that's easier easier to stay away from because you have to like sit there and wait for somebody to get served one up well i feel like that like something like a steak i i have every chef like it always rolls their eyes because on the rare occasion I eat a steak, I like to pretend it never lived. So I always want it well done. I want no no reminder. And I feel like at, in the times when I have tried to be a vegetarian, which I tend to go back to often, whenever I go, I, like the steak is the one that reminds you more than any other meat that you are eating an animal. So <laughs> it's hard. And when it's rare, it would really remind you. <laughs> that guilt factor would kick in. Yeah, that's true. Like a lot of the stuff, it's like just the flavor, you know, bacon and stuff like that. But in, right. anything on the bone and you know, the bloody thing. And yeah, when they do those analogs sometimes now with the burger, they make it bleed on purpose. Right. But, you know, I'm like, eh, you know, because I, I, you know, psychologically, you know, it's not the thing and it puts off people that don't want to deal with that. Like, right. You know, right. Uh, right. <laughs> oh. so I'm a little sanguine, though, so I'm like, I, I'm going to make myself sound like a vampire. That's not the intention, <laughs> but I, I'm a little attracted to like blood stuff and this and that, not in a gory way or whatever, but. Just, you know, like I smell it, and I'm kind of like, huh. <laughs> you know, it's just the opposite of how you're supposed to see it. Uh, I guess I'm slightly feral of the deal, but I managed to buy it through, through that uh, wildness. Well, as a vegan, how do you feel about this? Like you said, the kind of faux meat. Is, is that antith- like sort of the, the antithesis of what you're trying to do? You're not... You know, the idea of eating vegan to be healthy to for a political reason, making it look like a burger sort of seems like, well, what's the point of not eating a burger then? Well, I, I guess like in the case of a burger, that's a very good example, because like a, a lot of people like 
if it's like some other thing, like a, a cut of meat or, or something or a filet, you know, like they they have a little bit of a point. But something like a burger that's composed out of you <laughs> grinding it up and doing that and putting who knows what in there. I think you're all right with that one. Like, because, um, you know, it's more of something that goes on a bun and a texture. And uh, and you're right, I don't, like, tend to favor analogs. To be honest, I'll make fake sausage and grind it up and put it in something. But a lot, unless it's a themed thing, so, like, for Oktoberfest or something, I might use, like, something that looks more realistic. But uh, even at home, I, I have my, my to-go go-to burger is brown rice, usher, and the quinoa. And I love it. I love the texture a little old school but uh that's what i eat you know so i i hear you on that <laughs> but uh but something like uh you know like a patty or or things like that i think you're a little bit um more okay psychologically some people just don't like it whatsoever for exactly the reason you just specified um me personally you know i'm hit or miss <laughs> you know as an indulgent maybe i'll eat some just to try it, you know, someone's got like, we made a pork chop. It's like, oh, get you. Let's, let's check this out, you know, because I'm very curious and I want to see what other people are doing. But, yeah, I, I do, um, in my cooking, unless people really go gangbusters over something in particular, I tend to avoid analog. And now, you sort of bill yourself as the touring vegan chef. Do you ever long for sort of your own kitchen where you know where all your your – you know, your mise en place is where it always is and everything is just the same every day? Or do you like that complete flying by the seat of your pants with the kitchen? That's a good point to raise. Here uh, I, in my apartment, I'm, I'm in this humongous half. I mean, part of it is uninhabitable in the back. And I still like, I have a bow and arrow, so I have my target back there and I pad the wall so the landlord doesn't get back, but mad at me and I shoot my bow. But other than that, I don't usually open the hallway door into the nether region. But I, I have a pantry in here. I've got like, everything where I want it to be. And I'm like, okay, but it's like vaguely cluttered. So I've got that. And, uh, you know, that's a recent development in the past year. But, yes, I did move up here to Montana with the idea that I would open a vegan place. You know, that's very vague. And uh, <laughs> at first, I was like, you know, how about a, a bar slash cafe and then, then the cook stuff started, and I was like, how about not that? And we're going to wait and you know, do this other stuff. And uh, so now I'm, like, kind of got a lower target, like a, a little, a couple of sit-down spots, small place with the deli case, and uh, I guess semi, sort of fast casual stuff. And then if I wanted to do something formal, I'd go to another place. But, yes, exactly. I, I do have that urge to have a nice little kitchen with my control kitchen. Everything's going to be on roll so I can scoot it around or take a catering or cart it off if I have to abandon ship. So it's like my little rolling oven, my little rolling fryer, my rolling burners, everything rolling. Uh, so I love that. You'll notice that the rollers on there make it so that if I go, well, okay, this is very stale, then I'll just rearrange everything. And then a couple of days later, realize it doesn't make any sense and put it back the way I had it in the first place. Even here at home, I do that. So... Yes, like I, I do miss that kind of like curveball of something different, a different kitchen, a different town, a different circumstance. You know, I mean, I have pet peeves concerning that in particular lighting. <laughs> you can really hurt yeah. yourself if you can't see what you're doing. <laughs> Makes sense, right? You're chopping things with big ass knife, so fire, electrical outlets, you know, what could go wrong in the dark. <laughs> Jeez. Nothing. It's fine. <laughs> Everything's grilled. <laughs> it's always to like have that solid state, and then when I get it, I gotta go on a trip. <laughs> I gotta, right. I gotta do something That sounds like me. Just in, and I'm not doing anything as good as cooking. <laughs> like I gotta go somewhere. Where next? <laughs> The gypsy in me, for sure. I can be very mercurial and gregarious, but at the same time, I can I can be very reclusive and moody. And mm -hmm. then I'm like, I want my cozy bed. And then I'm like, I want to, you know, sleep on a bench at the Greyhound Station in Virginia because I feel <laughs> like going somewhere. You know, so right. it, it, it yo-yos around a bit. I'm trying I'm trying to straighten it out so that it has like a rhythm to it between the two. You know. So um, being up here, you know, it's pretty affordable. And uh, if I did, if I get a try again, like later in the spring, like May, to start 
attempting to open a place again. We'll see how it goes. And if, if that happens, I won't be able to take off for a while for any length of time until I had somebody that I could trust to do the right. the level of, of offering and the way that people are going to expect once it opens. They'll have me doing it, and then it's not so easy to slough it off onto someone else and have the customers. You know, they're going to be like, wait a minute, right. this is all wrong. It's just different. <laughs> Who is you know, but it has to be someone that, that understands, you? you know. Uh, right. And, but then after that, I think I would probably regularly schedule little trips, pop out, different stuff like that to like keep that touring aspect going because I, I do enjoy it and I don't want to eliminate it completely, right. regardless of how well right. things go here. No, you know, with all kinds of food, whether it's desserts, whether it's you know signature dishes across the world and across the country, everyone has sort of their own sort of style. Of all your travels and all the places you've been, where has the most unusual vegan style been? I mean, New Orleans has some odd proclivity. <laughs> like one one moment you're getting something amazing, like you've never had in life. You get to see French fries. I, I mean, a full boy is a good example here. So there might be French fries and dolmades and like fried egg plant, a couple of house sauces all on this, you know, house big bread. Or you could go to some other place and you wind up with, like, the, the Del Monte mix in a bowl of rice. You know, it was very, like, you never know what you're going to get. You know, some place yeah. might be like, we have vegan Bloody Marys, which, you know, because of the Worcestershire sauce. And, um, so they'll, that's a big deal. And, but then, you know, any other stuff there will be, like, terrible. There will be some place yeah. that has only one vegan thing, but it'll be amazing. So they're, they're interesting. And then I'd say in general Europe, and there's some very advanced, <laughs> like, that's, that's exactly like New Orleans, except on a grander scale in country to country, region to region. There'll be like a place with just something crazy. Like, here's your strawberry nacho. <laughs> what is yeah. this? And they're like, I'll think yeah. exactly. <laughs> and you're like, oh, brother. Um, but and then, and then the next place has like vegan venison and a beer hall and all these composed dishes or. You know, the Netherlands is a good example of this. If you, you, you got Surinamese or Indonesian, you know, you're going to find some good vegan dishes, right? And the Dutch themselves, <laughs> on the other hand, kind of like, Ooh, okay, you know. So, <laughs> I, I mean, their 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 house food is a little bit funky. You know, they've got like bitter ball and cosplay, it's like a cheese pop tart and stuff like that, and this stew, milk stew, and stew with pearls in it. <laughs> so well, you can, can wind up with that, or you could wind up with something a little more, you know, like like in uh, Danish or Berlin style that's a little more composed or, or with fringe like sensibility. Obviously, as a touring chef, uh, the last year has been kind of difficult that there's not been much touring for anybody. Is there anything you've been working on over the past year that you just cannot wait to? put in somebody's hands or maybe more specifically somebody's mouth i started a preliminary it's gonna sound a little ritty ditty but i started like preliminarily just with people i know like doing a uh, mail order and I'm, I'm having some fun coming up with different things and like doing that like on a more grand scale would take a while you know, because that's like, you know, it'll be like a lot of regulatory stuff. But locally, like, that could be applied to cottage. So, and uh, my dad was a food scientist, and I kind of head that direction a little bit. <laughs> and he was also a farmer and a food processor. But, uh, so I, I kind of like have this similar mind to him where I'm always trying to like go, okay, let's do that, you know, trying to figure it out. So it's been fun experimenting with that. And I like the idea of the triple application of this. And maybe not having everything be dried or canned or whatever, but like kind of freshening it up. So it would be like locally with a place, regionally with cottage, and uh, around the country with mail order. But having that like license, having that happening in a legitimate above ground level, and the, you know with input from other people, and I, I'd love that. And I think that's where I'm headed with that. And other than that, you know, I've been working on. Um, runes and tarot cards so i've got that bent a little bit and have been like okay. self starting the pedal sets of that and some, coming up with some games uh interesting board games and something that's a little bit more the cribbage so it's like Ooh. that's kind of crafty stuff and, and that's what i like i love that and i love that i can like get people into it and stuff 
and I'm working on cookbooks, but those are through microcosm, and, and it'll be a while before those come out. You'll be talking next year or 2023 on those. And they're fun. It's two more with Autumn, by the way, like one's Metallica and one's the Ramones. <laughs> so Metallica one's whatever song she's referred to, and, like, you could, like, sing the recipe. <laughs> to, <laughs> to that's the work, I got to say. And, you know, I know they're fairly litigious, so I try to be respectful. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. <laughs> I mean, with parody, you can kind of, that's, you know, already in with that kind of stuff. Like, yeah. If you're making jokes, you can kind of do what you want, you know. <laughs> can you give us a little preview? What what sort of vegan food do you think would make Lars happy when he's not suing teenagers? What is he, Danish or something? Maybe a fine mm-hmm. Danish meal. Yeah. I, I think lots of able skewer, so maybe he would like nice, tasty vegan able skewers. Those are those little, mm-hmm. like, pink balls that you get mm-hmm. in the place where you get the most everyone like, like in California. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I make savory ones too. I stuff them with a mushroom pesto and have a little sauce and stuff and put a spice wow. mix on them. They're pretty good. And they're eating like me and big oh, fan. Wow. That's my choice for Lars. For Kirk, I, like that. I think I think that's right. I'll be really <laughs> to my jam club when I get it up right. And to meet some of his, let's trade. <laughs> yes, right? That's perfect. I love that. on Joshua, check out joshuaplague.blogspot.com and you can get all of his books at your local independent bookstore or if you must at Amazon. You can follow us on all the various socials. Our website is whythepodcast.com and has all sorts of additional stories and videos. It's also where you can sign up for our newsletter. We're also on YouTube if you're into that kind of thing. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes because if you don't, We'll call your mother and tell her that she's completely right. You would look so much prettier if you smiled more. Why the Podcast is part of Mudhouse Media. Today's show was produced by myself and Heidi Hegquist. Our reluctant executive producers are John Sove and Sandy Stone. Our willing executive producers are Rachel Allen and Randy Jeanette. Our graphic designer is Samantha Mustonen. The theme song was performed by the Electrosynth O Magnetic Polyphonic Orchestra. This one's for Philippe. Thanks for joining us. Flash, we're coming home. Nigel, is that you? Are you here, Nigel?